you know, I remember one of, you know, one of your TikToks, like, how do you avoid um, having a defamation case yourself? You say, yes. this is my opinion, right? <laughs> this is my opinion. So, more the more, this is just my opinion, okay? <laughs> I love it. You've never met them. This has nothing to do with them. This yes. is just a generalization about the disorders, a description based on your knowledge. The Love and Order Podcast with your host, Lawyer Lamore. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The opinions expressed on this podcast are not legal advice that can be relied on. They are based solely on the limited information provided. These opinions do not create any attorney-client relationship. Those seeking legal advice should contact an attorney in the appropriate jurisdiction and practice area. We are one day post-verdict, and I have to be honest, I tried everything to find my eye drops so that I could have one scintilla, my new favorite word, of white space in my eyeballs. I have not slept. I am tired, but oh my God, it's finally over. And guess what? I have breaking news for all of you. There were other things going on in the world, outside of the four walls of the Fairfax County Courthouse. I know that we have been so consumed by this defamation case between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. But very, very sad news. Of course you have heard. And, you know, our guest today, we're going to be covering a number of topics, but I was yesterday researching the shooting in Uvalde. And of course, new news that there was another shooting in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Let me introduce our guest Forensic and board certified clinical psychologist, everyone's favorite forensic and board certified clinical psychologist on TikTok, Dr. Justin Dorenzo. How are you? Doing great, lawyer Lamore. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a treasure. I appreciate it. Absolutely, my pleasure. I love, you know, I love the professionals on social media who make this information accessible and easily understandable for everyone. And you're one of them. You are one of the superstars on social media who makes this information fun, right? Mental health, not not a fun issue to talk about. Very, very, very serious. And you know, when I when I first reached out, of course, we wanted to speak about Uvalde. We want to speak about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. But yesterday, as I said, I went online. There was another shooting in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Very little information out now. I believe, though, there were five fatalities. The shooter was included. Dr. Dorenzo, can you speak to the fact that sometimes there are copycats when these things happen. And is that something that is tied to some sort of mental makeup that these shooters might share? Sure. I mean, it, it, it can often it can often be the tipping point for somebody that is thinking about it. And it's as if it's permission. And it really depends upon people's makeup because people do the people have people you know, participate in these mass shootings for all for all different reasons. But mm -hmm. it certainly can be a tipping point. And we do see a cascading event as soon as there's the big one and there's lots of notoriety. I mean, we had Buffalo, right, two weeks ago. Right. And then right. Uvalde. And then, you know, so I expect them to, to keep coming. But in addition to that, I mean, we have we have mass killings all the time, too. Right. These are just the there ones that, that, that make the top stories. Right? I mean, people right. are getting killed by guns every day. Every single day. Yeah. And is there, is it true the idea that some people are just born evil? Is that a thing? Yeah, well, I mean, that's really looking at it from, from a, a religious perspective. But, you know, from, from a more clinical perspective, I see it as somebody being born without uh, the traits of having remorse or having empathy. And those types mm. of people we do label as mm -hmm. evil because they can really, they can do things that we can't do. Right. Mm. I mean, they, they, they don't have that. They don't take an emotional toll when they commit certain acts, you know, and like, like it usually starts in childhood where um, children are abusing animals for a thrill. And I know for me, I feel horribly guilty if I was abusing and hurting an animal, right. uh, but, but right. other people get a, get a certain charge from that. And, and those can be people that end up, uh, becoming antisocial. And people often think of antisocial, they think it's somebody that is introverted or somebody that doesn't like to be around people. But that, that's not what that, that means. It means somebody that doesn't have guilt or, or remorse and somebody that often becomes a serial killer, somebody that 
is antisocial or, ha- or is a sociopathic or a psychopath. Wow, that is so interesting. And you know, I never thought of it from the religious standpoint. That's a very, uh, that's very insightful. I never, I never thought of it that way. Um, Is there, you know, when you talk about killing an animal and not feeling remorse, that is so scary. And I would like to think that I could look at someone and know that they wouldn't care if they killed an animal, but is there, a, is there a way to kind of identify these people in society? Because if antisocial doesn't really mean um, that they are not hanging out with everyone, right? They're not, you know, going out and doing this and that. And, and it does sort of mean that, but in the sense that you're speaking, if it means that you have no empathy, is there a way for, for just the regular person to kind of identify these people? Well, so so it, it so somebody that is antisocial. I mean, it covers all spectrums of socioeconomic class, mm-hmm. all spectrums of intelligence and education too. So, so and and also the severity level level uh, you know varies from people that have some traits to people that are very severe. So it it, it really depend it really depends. Like you know, there are a lot there are there is a lot a lot of white collar. Uh, criminal type behavior that is done mm. by people, but also it's made up of people that are are in jail and and prison. So not that not that everybody there has an antisocial personality, um, but it is hard to decipher. The the thing is, people with personality disorders they cause a great strain on everybody else. But you know, like depression, anxiety, those kind of disorders cause problems for the person. But You know, if you're in a relationship with somebody and it's really confusing and they're harming you and nothing ever makes sense, it, 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 you know, it's possible that you're in a relationship with somebody with a personality disorder. Wow. Wow. And are, is that something that, and again, please forgive me if I'm using the wrong terms. You are the boss of this topic. So I I want, I, I want to ask, is there a way to address these types of issues? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, it, it's got to take a community effort. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of issues that, that have to be addressed. I mean, we can kind of go back and talk about the makeup of, of who, I'd who love to. Of, of, of what type of person would commit a school shooting or a mass shooting. And mm-hmm. here we're talking about who, who would most likely kill a group of child children or administrators. And there's really three types of people. Okay, and they they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. I mean, there can be there can be some overlap, uh, but you, you can have an antisocial personality that is carrying out a vendetta, or you can have somebody that has paranoid schizophrenia, and they think they're on a mission from God, right? Or they're or they're doing something else to cleanse the cleanse the earth, you know, or cleanse a certain area, or uh, you can have somebody that has been traumatized over and over again. Um, and it's very interesting because the first two are, are typically people that come from intact families, kind of mid-range socioeconomic wow. status. And the third one, though, somebody that has a long series of traumas, usually somebody from a lower socioeconomic class, usually have a very broken family. There's police involvement and things like that, which really kind of identify, really reflects the uh, Uvalde uh, oh, shooter. So- um, and but what happens is you have you have one of those three types of people, and again there can be some overlap, but the person faces a series of setbacks or, or failures, and they hit that tipping point, reach that tipping point, and then they do something. So, um, so so we can have one of those three types of people um, who hears then about something like Uvalde too, and right. that may tip them off and lead to them being a copycat also. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Is it a sense of them also wanting to feel included? Do they want to feel included or be bigger than what they are? Is that part of it? Well, I mean, it it can be, but, but also sometimes, you know, certain individuals feel bigger than they, than they really are. Ah, there we go. Somebody going in and and doing something like that and and having, uh, feeling that much, you know, feeling that, that great importance or, you know, of course, on the other end, just not, not valuing human life. So, I mean, that's. Right. That's right. Yeah. I I've, 
I've been so emotional about it. I was live on TikTok um, reading the verdict for Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. And then an hour later, I went back on and we were looking at the um, Jada Pinkett Smith came out and made a statement about the slap at the Oscars. And the story I saw right before that was the Tulsa, Oklahoma shooting. And I, I lost it. I lost it. And, you know, at the top of this show, I, I got a little bit emotional, too, because you can't imagine, right, in Texas, the shooting was 19 kids, two adults. The shooter had an yeah. AR-15. He also, I believe, shot his grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. Someone who I'm going to assume took care of him, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously loved him unconditionally. Well, not obviously. We, we don't know. I know probably in her heart. We don't know how she showed it. Um, and then this Tulsa, Oklahoma shooting at a hospital, at a hospital. Right. So, you know, it, it, it makes sense. You, you have to be void of empathy of all of these, yeah. all of these traits. You do, or you just are, are you're just pushed at a certain, you know, to a certain place, right? It's kind of like somebody that, I mean, somebody that commits suicide, people often think that they are um, so selfish for committing the act, but really it's an act of selflessness where they think that they're more of a burden to be alive so they are relieving everyone from from themselves wow, which wow. Is terrible. but but i think you know how do we how do we prevent things like this too you right. know and, and, the, and the problem is like if we're talking about kids i mean the issue i think is that um you know it's and and i and i'm not this you know this i am a moderate in political belief so i don't want you to think that i'm you know this conservative from the from the uh, southeast coast but of of, from Florida, I almost wore a Bernie sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah, you did. Okay. So, so, but I mean, but but it it, take, it takes a you know a family like only a only an intact you know only a, not necessarily an intact family, but parents that are working together, um, or a community that's communicating uh, knows the whole story for somebody, right? Because here it's like we do this uh, psychological autopsy after these horrible things happen. And then we just get bits and pieces of information from all these different sources, you know, friends or somebody online or this parent found out this, this teacher found out this over here, right? Or this principal said this, the grandmother said this, but nobody has the whole story except parents that would uh, be together or at least communicate, right? And so it, like, it really takes, uh, you know, it really takes a community that's, that's intact, I think, to uh, mitigate some of these things from happening. You know, because again, I mean, nobody knew everything, but if we knew everything, uh, you know, before this happened, somebody could could have stopped it. So, and I know that, that as a psychologist, I do have a duty to warn, duty, duty to protect. Um, in Florida, it's actually permissible. It's not a requirement if, if a patient is telling me that oh, wow. someone's going to kill, them, kill someone. Um, I have the option, right, to, to call the police and call the person and let them know. Uh, but in some states, it is a it's a requirement. But it did start off the the uh, Tarasoff law. It started in California, I think, with the university or the I can't remember which university or Regents University. OK, where a psych patient, a patient at the counseling center um, had told his psychologist that he was he was obsessed with a, uh, a female student that was at the university. And he told the psychologist that he was going to kill this lady that he had been stalking and the psychologist maintained his confidentiality and then he went and he killed this lady um so now we have those those laws and it's not in every it's not in every state but we do we need the we need, need those laws and then we need the the special protection or the special protective orders like the the injunctions that um that people can file if they're concerned that somebody is a danger and has weapons or prevents mm. them getting weapons and unfortunately it so and it's only a law in 19 states and dc wow. um and but the problem is in some states you it, it it typically takes a you to find a police officer to file the petition um in some states families mm. can do it. but I, you know there, there are just so many um so many obstacles right to to remove weapons from people that don't need weapons and um, you know, for my, I'm, I'm a weapon holder, you know, I have a concealed weapons permit right. I mean, I, I own guns. Um, but I think there needs to be a, there needs to be a balance. It's like both political parties are right. It's like, we forget about the power of, and it's not, it's not one or the other. It's like everything we need to 
we need to control certain weapons and we need to, we need to manage people better and be able to get, um, we, we need people to have access to mental health care. And if we're concerned about people, we need to be able to report them uh, with somehow balancing, you know, maintaining the rights too at the same time. So it's, it's, it's going to be complicated to fix this, but, but we can. I'm absolutely, absolutely with you because it's not the responsible gun holders that I'm afraid of. Those people actually make me feel protected in this yeah. crazy, crazy world, which is even sad to say, but those yeah. aren't the scary people. <laughs> well, right? well, the, the crazy thing, and I know I really shouldn't use that term in my profession, but when I went to, to get my concealed weapons permit several years ago, um, I remember being in the class and realizing these are the people that are doing it legally. I mean, and some of that I was, I was worried about being in the room with, but um, those are the people that are doing it legal. There's a lot of people that, that are carrying legally. So, um, but you know, if people are, if people need a psyche valve to fly a plane, right. I mean, you should have one to have a uh, almost, you know, a weapon of mass destruction, so to speak. You need a psych eval to pilot a plane, but not to own yeah. a gun. Well, you've got to pass a, you know, I'm not, I'm not a pilot, but it's a, it's like a, called a third, it's a third, it's a third level uh, type of medical evaluation that includes. I see, a, I see, I see. A psych, a psych eval, yeah. Wow. Well, wow. Yeah, we you can get an AK-47 though without one. Oh my God. Oh. That is, that is disgusting. That is, really, it's yeah. It's oh, really oh and it's, my God. Yeah. You were saying something, Dr. Dorenzo. You said, if we had known all these things before, you said something like that. Is there, and I think I saw this on your TikTok, if you see something, say something, because now we're seeing some text messages from that um, Uvalde shooter that were sent to, um, I, I think, a girlfriend or, or, or something similar, some partner of his. Whoa, 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 hello. Why aren't people opening up their mouths and well, yeah, telling? I mean, yeah, I mean, for, you know, for two reasons psychologically. I mean, there, there's the diffusion of responsibility, right? It's like when so, something mm. bad is happening to somebody, we naturally think that somebody else is going to take care of it, right? Ah. Uh. So, and then the other part is we, there, we have an optimism bias. I mean, we think that things are just going to work out. Things are going to be okay. The person's not going to do something bad. And as humans, I mean, we're, we're challenged with, the, with those two biases that prevent us from getting help for people that need, that need help. So, you know, I think we got to teach people about those biases and, and help them act, you know, help them recognize that and, and act. So, but if you do, if you see something, hear something, you got to, you got to say something. We're all, this is part of the community effort. We're all responsible for making, making this world a safer and, and better place. Absolutely. Wow. Optimism bias. I've never heard that before, but that it is absolutely, absolutely a thing. Um, yeah. And talking about collective, collective effort. So we, when these things happen, we grieve together. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we do. I mean, well, the ones that, you know, the people with empathy do. And that's like, yeah. you know, you know, when you when you get the chip, when you get chills or you're interested in finding out more and you really are feeling for these people, that's empathy. And somebody with with uh, antisocial personality mm. doesn't care. They don't have they don't have the feeling and can't understand why everybody is uh, mutually um, grieving over over this. And certainly we, we can all relate to this. And, you know, and the other thing is about children, too. It's like uh, as humans, um, we are so risk averse to uh, the innocence of, of children. So it certainly has a greater impact when we think of, of innocent children being 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 murdered, need, you know, certainly need, needlessly. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. Dr. Dorenzo, I don't know if you've heard this. I'm, I'm sure you have heard the couple. There was a teacher who was shot and killed her mm. husband two days later. Sure. Passed away of what people are saying is a broken heart. Yeah. The, the broken heart uh, syndrome, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, 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 a 
cardiac condition where the, the heart weakens um, when you're under great strain. And yes, somebody can die from a broken heart. I mean, it's really, it's like one extra tragedy, right? Um, with yes. this, and, I, and I heard that, I mean, the, the family has f four children. Yes. Um, just re you know, really, really sad. I hope people are, are participating in, the, in that GoFundMe. Yes, I think it's in the millions. Okay, great. Yeah, Wonderful. yeah, I think I think it's in the millions, and they were high school sweethearts, so that I really. Mean, I mean, just really sad. I mean, everybody, right? Everybody is so important that, that lost their life. Every right. single but, but person. It's just, it's just that extra layer with with all the with all the loss. Yeah, with all the loss. So yeah, and you know what's so what's so neat is you know you I mean you and I I mean we're you know. You're, I mean, you are the TikTok lawyer, right? You are the <laughs> official TikTok lawyer. Um, but I mean, like we have a voice now too that we, I mean, that's what's so amazing about this is we can, you know, I mean, we can just kind of create this and, and talk and, and help other people, right? Um, and that's reach so many people versus just seeing one client at a time and, and making the world a better place, right? We're able to do this. So it's really, really fascinating to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we're so, so lucky. And that's why I wanted I wanted to start this episode talking about the shootings, which, you know, they make us emotional, but we have this platform, like you said, these platforms that people are now listening to us and we are giving them a front row seat of these professions, right? And yeah. giving them access to the way we think, the way our profession sees things and getting their input. Um, and, yeah. you know, their their input, of course, everyone is hurt by, by the shootings and everything that's going on. And everyone was shocked yesterday at the total to Oklahoma shooting at a hospital. Um, but other news yesterday, not as important, but it did happen. The world has been watching for six weeks. Mm -hmm. We saw that after six weeks, the defamation verdicts in the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard case. Amber Heard, she won for one claim. One cross complaint, yeah. one claim. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, how to structure it right to make everyone understand. This is the jury's verdict. We have to respect it. Whether or not you agree with it is a whole different thing. But Johnny Depp won on all three claims. Amber Heard won on one claim. Mm -hmm. Right, Johnny mm -hmm. Depp. $10 million in compensatory damages, $5 million in punitive damages, Amber Heard, $2 million in compensatory damages, and zero in punitive damages. Now, sure. whoa, that jury, again, I'm going to use the word scintilla. There was not a scintilla of credibility that they could find on Amber's side. They didn't believe a word that she said. That is the only way to get to a verdict like the one we saw yesterday. Yes. And I think, because I have you here, I, I really want to talk about this, Dr. Dorenzo. I think that one thing Johnny's side did very well mm -hmm. was physician Dr. Curry right sure. before Amber told her story to tell that jury mm -hmm. I've evaluated this person I am a professional not board certified not board yeah. certified but, but I am a professional who evaluated this human being here are my findings and here is what those findings mean and that is the performance right his side was talking about performance of a lifetime that is the performance you are going to see from the other side when they tell their story. I think they did that brilliantly. Yeah. I had one issue. I had one issue with Dr. Curry that I will touch on. Um, okay. And maybe we'll, we'll start with this. The one credibility issue I had. Okay. Well, I'll, say, I'll say two. <laughs> okay, that, I, that I had as an attorney. Excellent witness, fan favorite. She was great. It has nothing to do with her findings. She's not board certified. I think that because people don't really know a lot about the differences between being board certified and not, um, sure. I think the one thing they know is board certified means you're really legit. I think that's what the yeah. consensus is. So when I heard she wasn't board certified, I thought, oh my God, that jury might not trust her, even though she gave great testimony. You know, she explained yeah. things so well. She's very, very eloquent. We went to the yeah. same, uh, same graduate school too. Oh, I love it. Oh. Both did. 
both went to Nova Southeastern University and, and became psychologists there. So. Oh my God. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I went to the same law school as Camille Vasquez. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, and, the, and the other credibility issue I had was um, that she had a five hour dinner at Johnny Depp's house. Okay. That, that for an expert, at least sure. for, you know, as attorneys, we already know you're going to be, you're, first of all, you're going to be subpoenaed. And if we go to trial, sure. you're absolutely a witness. Sure. You know, the other side's going to ask gonna about that. that. <laughs> But she, but she said she said that he didn't really communicate either. Right? Dur that he was just there for observation. It was kind of like a a, a vetting process. A yes, vetting she, it was a vetting she, dinner. Yes, uh. she said it wasn't a dinner. It was an interview, and because it went so long, we had dinner. She, okay. <laughs> Brilliant, Brilliant. Because let sure. me tell you, at least for me, our clients don't vet the experts. We vet the experts and we tell our clients who we think is the best fit. And sometimes they'll have a call with them, but their biggest concern is how much does the expert cost? Right. right. So right. Um, I, I don't know for you. Have you, um, are you an expert in court? Have you ever appeared in court or been I'm, subpoenaed? I'm in any? court. I'm court um, monthly. Yes. On working cases. So have I been to dinner? At a <laughs> um no, I mean, I've been to dinner with attorneys. If I've been at, Absolutely. if I've gone out, of if I've gone out of town to review uh, the case to prepare for testimony the next day, yes, right, but, but, but not to be, not to be invited <laughs> at somebody's house, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was one of those things that when I heard it, I'm like, oh no, they're never going to believe her. Why did she do that? She knew they were gonna ask her, but sure. they 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 were good with it. Sure. I mean they were. They were. I, mean, the, I mean the issue, you know, like in, in my I mean you you are in LA, right? It's a it's yes. a huge community, and I'm I'm in a very small community. Mm -hmm. So I know, I mean, I know all the lawyers, I know the judges. Um, I am, so, am social with them too at times. So if I'm testifying, they will always provide that, you know, that, that disclaimer that they know me, you know, personally um, and can we proceed? So, and I've, I've never, I've never had a, never had a client have an issue. So with that, it's just, right. Just, right. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was so interesting and I thought that it might um, have some sort of impact on the jury, but it didn't, it didn't. No. It didn't. It didn't. And, 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 you know, she did, she did give a good response and whether there was alcohol, I mean, you know, the, the, the uh, reference to a, a, a mule. And yes. Just, it was, it was uh, I mean, she played it off very well and it was, a, she, it was okay. I mean, she seemed very perfect. She was very professional and eloquent. Yes, that's what it was. She was very professional, very eloquent, um, and she, she was she was just brilliant. So let me ask you. She, sure. I believe, again, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe she diagnosed Amber Heard with two different mental right. health um, disorders. Okay, and and then can I ask you? And then did she did so? She conducted an independent psychological of both of them. Is that is that? Is that what I I'm don't believe I. I don't believe it was of both of them. I okay, just just through observation then. So she had spent because maybe that was Hughes that spent twenty nine hours with her. I think that that Hughes. was Doctor Curry. Doctor Curry spent twenty nine, but Doctor okay. Curry Doctor Curry spent several hours with Amber Heard. She did it by yeah. Her her findings were based on meeting her and speaking to her. That okay. I know for sure. I think okay. she was the one with twenty eight or twenty nine hours. Okay, so then so that's then that's fair to make a to make a diagnosis. Great. Okay. So, so her two were, I believe, bipolar, bipolar disorder. No. I thought borderline and histrionic personality disorder. There we go. That's why we have you here because so, I get, I get confused because of the acronym. Yep. The bipolar and yeah. Yep. And by, you know, bipolar people often say, uh, people often call borderlines bipolar because they are so bipolar uh, with their mood or they have emotional ability. They have lots of mood swings. I see. Okay. So can you explain a little bit about both disorders? Sure. So, so both, dis so the way that we, so we have three clusters of personality disorders and 
one to, um, cluster A are the kind of the odd and eccentric. Uh, cluster B are uh, personalities that are mo that are moody and uh, let's say tempestuous. Mm. Um, and then cluster C are the more anxious type personalities. So cluster B is made up of antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorder. Ooh. So those all really overlap and can be, can be expressed differently in males and females. Uh, but somebody with histrionic, that is somebody that is seductive, sensual, uh, they need to be the center of attention. So they're very dramatic. Like histrionic is really somebody that is extremely dramatic. So to give her that diagnosis and say, here comes the show, right? Follow. Yep. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. And then the bo and borderline is somewhat borderline personality, somebody that they um, idealize the, a person and then all of a sudden they're devaluing them. So, and she even would talk about Depp as, you know, I love you, you know, I love Johnny and then talk about how bad he was, but somebody that really fears abandonment um, and they go to great lengths to avoid ban abandonment and do crazy stuff. So, and this is like her, like defecating on, defecating on the bed mm -hmm. um, and just, uh, you know, like the, the allegations that she made about, about him were, um, history were somewhat histrionic, right? Even though we know, I mean, they had a, I mean, they did have this tempestuous, volatile, really toxic, really toxic marriage, right? And it, and yes. it seems like the, re the relationship can continues. Yes. So, but, yes. But, but borderlines, and this just might, this, so, I mean, this is from the research and of course I'm not talking about them specifically, but you know, I remember one of, you know, one of your TikToks, like how do you avoid, um, having a defamation case yourself, you say, yes. this is my opinion, right? <laughs> this is just my opinion. So, more the more, this is just my opinion. Okay? <laughs> you, I love it. You've never met them. This has nothing to do with them. This yes. is just a generalization about the disorders, a description based on your yeah. knowledge. In terms of relationships, um, in terms of relationships, a borderline or histrionic is often with a, a man that is antisocial or narcissistic, um, or a, 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 a person that is very, a, a man that has dependent personality disorder. You know, the guy, he like depend, he like needs the woman and he's always appeasing and placating the moods and the erratic right. behavior. So um it's you know in in my opinion you know, you know yes. depth would probably fit somewhere um in in that in that arrangement and i know he talked a little bit about his childhood and just you know really rocky rocky childhood a lot of abuse growing up so um it's plausible that he's then attracted to somebody that was 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 abusive too not to say that he was not abusive as well and right yeah it's um you know it's Speaking of empathy, you have to have empathy for both of them. They both have had trauma in their lives. And I uh -huh. think that it continued in this relationship. And one of my questions, you already answered it, was were, were they in a toxic relationship? My opinion has always been yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they and they definitely they definitely were. And then and the thing is, you know, this whole this domestic violence. I mean, can mm. we kind of jump in and talk about this? Absolutely. You know, because we often talk about coercion and control as like that is the hallmark of domestic violence. And we know from research, because this is all this all comes from the Duluth model. This is that uh, this is that domestic violence wheel. The, the yes, the cycle, the cycle or, or, or not, not this, I, the cycle is building tension mm. and then the abuse and then reconciliation, calm and then building tension again. So this is, that is, uh, um, and I believe, I mean, that comes from Lenore Walker, another prof a professor at, uh, or the, the battered woman syndrome. Battered yeah. woman, yes. Okay. Back. Um, and you keep returning to the relationship because of the tension, the reconciliation, the calm, and then it happens again. Um, but the, the, the uh, wheel is the Duluth model from like the 70s or 80s, and it was all based on power and control and coercion. 
through physical and sexual violence. And then this is where that we, I think there's it made, made up of eight sections where there's uh, financial abuse, um, you know, sexual abuse, isolation, like all, all different types. And what we know though, is that's really just one aspect of domestic violence. And it's, it's usually, it's the domestic violence that is often seen in agencies, like when, when violence gets reported, it's not the, it's not the domestic violence in the general public. I mean, most, um, most couples that are violent, it's situational couple violence. It's Uh. because of stress, right? And then often um, there's violence related to there's separation instigated violence that, in family law, different cases, yep. like conflict yep. cases, there's usually a huge blow up at the end because somebody is so traumatized by the end of the relationship or there's shame. And then the, uh, and then, you know, somebody strikes and calls the police and then there's an injunction. And now we're saying there was coercion and control and this long history of domestic violence when there wasn't right. It was just, it was just the end of the, it was the end of a bad marriage. Right. Um, but it, but it's more common to have situational couple violence, and that doesn't mean that somebody's they're not nobody's practicing coercion and control. It's just like one or two, um, you know, people with poor coping skills that probably are intermixing drugs and alcohol, and there may be some personality traits that are really dysfunctional, and they're just really toxic. Nobody's there's not coercion and control. There's not manipulation. I mean, there is, but it's not like somebody's being crippled, right? I and I think that's what we were talking about in this in this case. They're just really two toxic people that didn't belong together. Yeah, they didn't belong together. And I think I think it just became worse and worse because they were together. Do you yeah. do you see a lot of couples? I'm, do you see a lot of couples that stay together after bouts of domestic violence? Yeah. So that I mean, that is a great question. So um, if there is coercion and control. No. Okay. And I guess I, I would give, I would give an example of, you know, I remember seeing, seeing, uh, seeing a couple and uh, I first saw the, the, the wife and she reported to me that the, the husband was being physically violent. And then, but she had to have, she secretly had the appointment and then he ended up coming to a couple appointments and he wouldn't sit down. He just like stood in the room with his arms crossed. And I was, I was worried like he was going to shoot me. Right? Mm-hmm. And I kept telling him to sit down. He wouldn't sit down. I made sure he wasn't behind me. But the, those relationships don't typically don't last when there is. I mean, the, he was very pathological. And I mean, he probably had an antisocial personality. And she she was the dependent personality who who was afraid to to leave the relationship. Uh, but people with situational violence that are just really dysfunctional, those they just need to learn better coping. So. Just because there's violence, it doesn't mean that the relationship's going to end. But when there, again, when there's coercion and control, or uh, personality-induced violence, those relationships need to end because it usually takes the separation because the other person's not just not safe because the the other person the the violent person is so unpredictable. Mm. So, Doctor Dorenzo, are you in your profession? allowed to tell people to leave their partners or their situation? Yeah. So our, our training typically suggests, no, you're supposed to help them come to the answer themselves through Socratic questioning. Okay. But like in your, in your profession, people are coming for answers and are paying Mm. money for answers. So, you know, we, we help, I mean, we help people and try to be as expeditious as possible in giving them the right answer and based on your clinical knowledge and the research i mean you you know if somebody should stay in a relationship or not pretty quickly um i'm certainly not always right right but right. i think for, i mean for the most part i you know i think in and in, in our in my profession i mean you should be telling people if they're in a very toxic relationship that uh has a you know a very poor prognosis or you at least give the, you know, you tell people that what the risk is, whether right. you know, continue to stay in the relationship. And uh, I mean, I will hear from people years later, thank you, you know, or I got remarried. I'm so happy. Um, or, you know, years later, like I, I'm, you know, I'm now I'm pro I'm now on Prozac to be married. To, mm. to this person. Um, you know, please help me now. How do I escape? <laughs> you know, wow. years later. So. 
but yeah, I think it's our do. I think it's our duty to tell people what the risks are to stay if they're going to stay in a very volatile, toxic, dangerous, damaging relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think you're I think you're totally right. I have people who ask me all the time if they should get divorced. And my response is, if you're calling me for a consultation, yeah. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> you know, but it's not you and I tell them it's not up to me, but but if I were if I were going through the steps to find an attorney, get the number, schedule a consultation, call, have them call me three days later, and I'm still asking the same questions. Maybe the answer is yes. Maybe the answer yeah. is yes. Well, it's like there there are five or six stages of, of divorce, right? And the first one is that emotional divorce, and it, it's the yes. it's it's the longest one to it takes the longest time to get there, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, there's been lots of planning before they're calling you yes. about whether to have whether to be divorced or not. So. Absolutely. But, you know, and I think some and, and, you know, some that you will refer back out and say, why don't you get some help? Maybe you're not ready. Right. Absolutely. Um, and so but I think once people reach that point, you know, the prognosis is not so good. Right. Because it is. I mean, for you know, even today, for people to get divorced, things are probably pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, a lot of questions with the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial pertaining to these mental health professionals being able to speak to the court and testify about this information. So people are really scared. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Dorenzo, they're scared. They're scared. So tell us how that happens. How is the, what is the, uh, the, the, pa the doctor patient privilege and mm -hmm. the rules of confidentiality? And what does it take for you to be able to testify in a court of law about these private, intimate things that people have told you? I know. And, and I will just say that um, it, it makes me feel uneasy. I, I do high stakes custody evaluations in Florida. We call them wow. social investigation. So, mm. I mean, I get all the mental health records, right. From mm. 10 years ago, right. When this couple was in, in therapy and it just blows me away. These people never thought that somebody would be reviewing these records. And, you know, it's really sad because you hear about the struggles or that they were once in love too, you know, and they, mm. were, they were managing some other issue, but how this, how this works is your records are, I mean, they are generally protected, okay? And if, if I get a subpoena from an attorney that, you know, they're going through a divorce and, or, you know, my, I, get a, I get a subpoena from the other spouse, we don't, we don't release records. Um, it takes an order from the, the judge, not just as a, a subpoena and lots of threats from an attorney, but an order from the judge yes. um, or a release from both, from both parties. So, and it, so if, they, if it was two, the husband and wife, um, it's got to be both of them that, that are releasing these records. Um, or if it's just the individual, because sometimes one party will be having individual treatment or, or has gone to uh, drug and alcohol rehab. Um, but I mean, the, they're, 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 they're very protected unless, unless those records need to be seen. And really, you leave it up to the parties to release it. Or if a judge is demanding that those records are, are released, then they, then they do get released. But we make every effort to maintain confidentiality because I feel like I, I can't help people if they don't trust me. And then people will often ask me, um, like, you know, business people uh, or um, healthcare providers that are aware of um, the, that sometimes records seep out and information seeps out. And I live in a small community. They will ask me, can you not take notes? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> what we talk about. And I tell them, you know, I might not remember everything uh, the, the next time you come back and see me, but but I but I will be very minimal about what I write. So so people can protect themselves that way. But the problem is we don't we don't take insurance, so nobody's we I don't have to justify any diagnosis. But for most people that are you are that are going through insurance, the the provider has to write everything in the record to justify. Uh, reimbursement for those services. So, you know, if you wow. want it private, see somebody, see somebody out of pocket pay, by paying out of pocket. Wow. That is great Intel. That is great, great Intel. I so love it. Your clients, it's okay. Tell them not to document, even though there are boards do have some 
documentation requirements. So, you know, I meet those standards. I mean, just, but that, that's, they're very low standards, you know, date right. and time of the appointment and, and subject matter and a, di and a diagnosis if necessary. Yeah, I think that's going to put a lot of people's minds at ease because I think that mental health ever since um, COVID, everyone has now been very comfortable about speaking about it and being open open to seeing a professional. Um, yeah. and, and, and I want your opinion on this. I want to end on this. So we're talking about these shooters who obviously – something there with mental health. We're talking about this couple, obviously something there with mental health. We're both professionals on social media, mental health issues all across the board, right? And, and back to just the collective effort and all of us being one community together, how do we deal with the news and social media and seeing all these things that are not... Uh, directly related to us. We're not involved in these situations, but we see them. We feel them. How do we just as individuals and as a community deal with these things and kind of disconnect from them and, you know, be able to relax when we're seeing everything all the time. You can't get away from it. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to be disciplined and take a break mm -hmm. and get, get some exercise, spend some time with your family, put your phone down, you know, or, or be that be so disciplined that you schedule your time to be on social media and, and read the news. So, I mean, I just got I got a text from my brother today who has two young children. I, I have four kids, but my yes, brother, yes. one of my brothers has, has two kids. And he just said I had to, I had to turn off the news for a week after this Uvalde case because he just kept thinking of his own kids at school. Right. So, yeah. um yeah, we are we're impacted. So you you get you gotta be measured about how much you consume. I love so that. Even yeah. though even though it's it is a it's addicting, right? Because I mean you're probably like me though, even though you know I don't always practice what I preach because I feel like I, I have to be in tune just like you about what's happening in the, mm -hmm. in the media. So I mean I wake up at three o'clock in the morning. I mean the first thing I do, I grab my phone, see I look on uh, Associated Press, see what's happening, right? <laughs> I might be up for an hour reading, <laughs> right? but then you put it down. But, but I also am more measured at not, not, um, you know, I consume information, but I don't have to feel, I don't feel it. You know, I really take steps to, to not, not feel what I'm reading. So it's not so overwhelming, but even like these mass shootings, I, I have to, I have to stop at some point. Right. Yeah. I think it's discipline. Very sad, very saddening. Very, yeah. very saddening. Very, very saddening. And I know I said we're almost done. I always do this. I always think of one last thing, okay. one last thing. But I want to make very clear because I know that um, I don't even remember the other doctor's name. Dr. Curry was the star, but there, Hughes. Dr. Hughes, no disrespect or slander to Dr. Hughes. I'm sorry, I forgot the name. Dr. Hughes got a lot of backlash about making mental health sound like a gendered issue. And I want to make very clear that just as professionals, you, me, everyone, when we sometimes say he or she, it's most likely based on just the way people speak, right? Or maybe a topic we were talking about or a couple we were talking about before, but it's not none of these issues, DV, mental health issues, they are not gendered issues. They are not gendered issues. So if Someone says he or she, I don't ever take it as they are um, making it a, gen a gendered issue. I think she got a lot of um, backlash because of that. Yeah. But I, I think it was because she kept saying it for like two hours. <laughs> she didn't catch yeah. herself once. So I just want to make very clear for the audience to just remember, you know, it's it's people are getting used to not speaking that way. And I yeah. think a lot of, you know, I don't know how often Dr. Hughes was in court. She said often, I don't know, you know, I don't know. But do you want to touch on that at all? Because I think that no one is doing it. Most people don't do it on purpose. I certainly don't if I've ever had a slip up like that. But do you want to speak on that at all? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do a little bit. I mean, because we've, we've even moved away from DV a little bit to call it interpersonal violence. Mm. Because domestic violence, because traditionally it was a hus husband and a wife. 
Yes. Right? I mean, that's how we think about it. So we now call it IPV, interpersonal violence. And the research looks at same-sex couples and, um, you know, the rates are, I mean, the rates are even higher in, in same-sex couples. Mm. Um, so especially what, you know, two, two gay men, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they can be certainly more violent, but even in lesbian couples that there can be violence. But we know that, um, you know, if, if we're looking at, you know, men in general, uh, one, it's one in four are subject to, the, to in, interpersonal violence. And for women, it's one in three. Um, but I think we do, you know, but we, we often uh, rationalize uh, about that it's more severe for women when there, when there is violence because of uh, proportionality or the, you know, a man's size versus a, a woman's physical size. Yeah. And what people don't realize is that, I mean, I, I see many men that tell me, you know, she's a hitter, she's a hitter, right? Or, wow. you know, they'll get a black eye, they'll get bruised. Women are more prone to use objects, too, mm. um, because there is a size difference. And, uh, you know, there's that emotional shame for a man that cannot come forward when his, um, what, you know, female or, or woman gendered partner is abu abusing them. So, you know, it's hard for everybody. We've got to not be, we can't be violent. So we got to, we got to be kinder, right? And this is right. part of. I mean, even when these things, these horrible things happen, I mean, I do think that, I mean, because there's been an increase in mass shootings and violence, and a lot of this is about is COVID and um, what, what our politicians are doing to us. Mm. Like, we, are, we are mere pawns, right? All of us, yeah. we're mere pawns. And uh, they're just using us and using our reactions to, uh, you know, for their, for their own political agendas. So um you know it's all the stress we we just we need to come together and, and be be a kinder be a kinder world i and think i think and i forget what's i mean russia and ukraine it's like uh you know we, i don't even know what's happening there anymore it's like we're you know poor Zelensky. it's like we don't you know don't care what's happening so but there's all these horrible things and atrocities happening we just need to be kinder and more loving Absolutely. I'm a hundred percent with you. And I want to, and you know, I've, I've told my audience, everyone I know is anti DV. A male victim of DV is nothing new to all of us in the profession. Yeah. I, I understand that the wider audience has now learned that men can be victims of DV. Yeah. We knew that. We always knew that, but you're right. It's just the traditional sense that people were just used to hearing about. So it was a bit polarizing, I think at times to I hear know. something. Different. I mean, I was ready for hashtag yes I am. Oh you know, my goodness! <laughs> but I didn't see it. I didn't yeah. see it. So I yeah. mean, I think this is almost a good. But this is like kind of a pushback against hashtag Me Too. I'm not saying you know. We've seen there, hashtag Men Too. Oh, I haven't. I haven't seen that. But it be, you know, yes I am. When Depp said yes, right? I am. That was beautiful. When he yeah. said yes I am, that was beautiful. You're yeah. so right. Yes. So yes. It was some, it's a healthy, it's a healthy pushback to, for us to recognize that it, it, it goes, it goes both ways. Healthy pushback. I yeah. love that. Dr. Dorenzo, where can people find your fun, informative, educational, engaging content? Yes. At dr.justindorenzo or uh, drdorenzo.com. I really I appreciate it. this, Laura Lamore. You're, you know, Absolutely. you, you know, you're, we are your fan here. Big fan on the East Coast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. It was so nice having you on. Thank you. And Thank I'll you. see you on TikTok, Instagram, Ooh. online, everywhere. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorenzo. Right. Have a great weekend and the rest Thank of the week. Thank you. You too. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The opinions expressed on this podcast are not legal advice that can be relied on. They are based solely on the limited information provided. These opinions do not create any attorney-client relationship. Those seeking legal advice should contact an attorney in the appropriate jurisdiction and practice area.